Uh, Budri Gamara Warami, which is to say, good afternoon and welcome the language of the Darug people. They are the traditional owners on the lands where my office is located at Warrington and indeed the traditional owners of the lands where I live. I thank them for the gift that are those lands and I give a shout out to the Gandangara and Tharawal people as well because those mobs have owned the lands on which our other campuses are located. And I thank them all for the support they give to Western Sydney University and the work that we do in Greater Western Sydney. And, of course, if there are any First Nations people uh, present with us today here in uh, Parramatta or, indeed, joining us by Zoom, then I acknowledge that these were Aboriginal lands yesterday, that they are today, and they will be tomorrow. Welcome uh, to Western Sydney. Uh, on behalf of Western Sydney, I'd like to welcome you all to the culmination of our 2023 Thought Leadership Series. This important series was brought to you by the Library at Western Sydney University. The series celebrates and promotes the number one Times Higher Education impact ranking in 2023, and that being the second year in a row in which we are ranked the first in the world. The United Nations, oh, sorry, the uh, Times Higher Education impact rankings are unique because they evaluate universities against those United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as we march towards 2030. We were ranked number one out of 1,591 universities. And this ongoing thought leadership series makes visible the work being undertaken across this university as part of our sustainability and resilience decadal strategy towards 2030 as well. It is Western demonstrating global leadership and our engagement and our partnering. Let me brag a little bit more. Uh, Western are number one in the world for responsible consumption and production of all universities. Number five for sustainable cities and communities. Number seven for climate action. But our engagement, collaboration and leadership are best demonstrated in our number one ranking in the world for SDG 17 Partnership for the Goals. Let me restate that. Western Sydney University ranked first in the world of all universities for partnering. The Thought Leadership Series, let me say something about that. It began in November 2022 with Malden Nurnagur, Partnerships for Sustainable Regional Futures, led by Associate Professors Louise Crabtree Hayes and Neil Perry. Since then, the seminars have covered these sorts of topics, urban cooling, university decarbonisation, women and STEM, bushfire, fauna protection, disability, SDGs and smart computing, circular economy, peace building, river protection and advocacy. And last week, we had a fantastic presentation from our Dean of Science, Professor Graciela Metnich, on teaching for sustainability. Amazing. Absolutely an amazing series. The success of this series cannot be measured just in numbers. I accept that, but I love numbers. And approximately 1,800 people connected with the series so far, including 983 event attendees, and almost the same number attending via video recordings. These events reached a wide and diverse audience, such as the community and special interest groups, staff from other universities and local councils. Fantastic. And the 17th presentation today, as we gather for the Thought Leadership Series, is from uh, Catherine Fleming. But before I go to introduce uh, Professor Fleming, let me just acknowledge the magnificent work of Emma Boddington and Bhadra Chandran uh, in coordinating this series. And thank you to the library, library leadership, of course, and including uh, the executive director, Fiona Salisbury. Today, though, we feature Professor Catherine Fleming, who will discuss sustainable food systems. Professor Fleming is lecturer in public health in the School of Health Sciences, Western Sydney University, and is stream co-lead for youth participation and engagement in the Young and Resilient Research Centre. Her expertise is in paediatric nutrition. Um, and so we'll hear today about sustainable food systems, so vital to ensure that all children and adolescents access nutritious, safe and affordable food. Regrettably, our current food systems fall short, leaving many young individuals without adequate diversity in their diets. We need urgent, indeed transformative action to guarantee children's rights to good nutrition. Western Sydney University has partnered with UNICEF to amplify the voices of children worldwide 
through participatory food system dialogues across 18 countries. But let's hear more. Please welcome Professor Catherine Fleming. Thank you very much for having me today and for your kind words. I'm, yeah, really excited to be able to share with you what we've been working on in our partnership. I'm just going to move the slides forward. Just check that you can hear me okay. Great. Um, Kevin did a wonderful acknowledgement. I'd also just like to um, pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and just acknowledge that um, First Nations people really were the first um, custodians of food systems and the incredible knowledge that they withhold around food systems is so vital and something that we should reflect on regularly, I think, as we move forward um, in addressing um, sustainable food systems and, and um, what I'll be covering today. So this, um, today I will be presenting the findings from our study we conducted in 2021. And Kevin just talked about the partnerships that um, the university has been noted for. And um, this really is um, a partnership that um, has been going on for several years with UNICEF in this work and um, continues to grow strong. So I'll be um, sharing how that came about, the partnership with UNICEF, and then that how that led to this project, which was then delivered at the UN Food Systems Summit. That's me. Kevin gave me a nice promotion, which which I will take on board, but maybe not quite there yet. Thanks, Kevin. Um, still just a doctor. Um, but as he mentioned, I'm in the School of Health Sciences and um, co-lead um, in Young and Resilient Research Centre, which is where this uh, project was led from. Like I said, it was a partnership between UNICEF and Young and Resilient Research Centre here at the university. Behind every great project is an amazing team. There's no, absolutely no means that we did this huge amount of data collection um, globally without a huge team behind us and a wonderful team that they are. I'd like to thank Professor Amanda Third, who um, co-led this with me, and also the fantastic uh, research team, Garish Lala, Shiva Chandra, Caitlin Hockey, um, and also our UNICEF colleagues that were led by um, Deepika Sharma and a huge range of in-country officers we had to mobilise this and you'll, you'll see just what we had to mobilise in such a short period of time. So overwhelmingly, when we talked to young people, they told us their food matters. Their food matters in many different ways and it's important to look at how we can ensure we have sustainable food systems that support young people. I'll be telling you some of their stories today and focusing on what they told us. Every child has the right to nutrition. Yet, we're still seeing huge amounts of children that are stunted, wasted, and also increasing numbers that are overweight. Adolescence, we're talking about children and young people 10 to 19 years of age, is a period of rapid and transformative growth, which requires quality nutrition to survive, grow, and develop. Yet, adolescents are some of the most vulnerable and marginalised populations across the world. Often, adolescents fail to meet their nutritional needs, exposing themselves to deficiencies which impact their long-term growth. The absence of quality nutrition during this key period of development contributes to impaired cognitive function and also impacts their ability to thrive and socially um, and participate fully in social, cultural and economic aspects of life. This is a crucial window similar to that of the early years of life. This is also where lifelong habits are formed. Yet, current food systems are failing young people and the planet. Given children's increased exposure to poor diets, suboptimal food environments and harmful practices, so we know that they're exposed to poor diets and suboptimal food environments. So we need to be looking at how we can fix these food systems, targeting the structural drivers, production, distribution and consumption 
through food systems, through policies, services and actors willing to ensure that children's access to good quality nutrition takes place. So that leads us to where we are today. As part of the preparation for the UN Food Systems Summit in 2021, the UNICEF Executive Director at the time, Henrietta Four, and WHO Special Envoy, Dr. David Navarro, met to discuss how UNICEF could best support the summit's Food System Dialogues initiative. The Executive Director committed to supporting the UN Food Systems Summit to accelerating the efforts to transform food systems and achieve sustainable development goals by 2030. So UNICEF decided to engage with children and young people through dialogues around food systems and to add value to the summit. We were then asked to provide workshops and take and undertake this rather large task at the time of enabling children all across the globe to participate in these dialogues that were being presented at the UN Food System through the data and information that I'll prepare uh, that I'll present to you today. It was quite a tight timeline, which you can see there. So we were asked to uh, consult in April of 21. We then implemented the workshops in June and July of 21. We had to write the report by August, and these were then delivered uh, in September at the Food Systems Summits by Henrietta Four and David Navarro. How did we do it? So I'm going to step you through the methods of how we engage and talk to young people across the world around their food systems and what they wanted to see change, that they wanted to hear and have their voices heard with at that summit. I'll talk you through the methods and then I'll share the results with you. The workshops were based on dialogue, dialogues using distributed data generation method pioneered by the Young and Resilient Research Centre and successfully used in several international projects since 2014. The distributed data generation methodology involves partner organisations, so in this case UNICEF, and their, and their partners within countries, so the staff from the in-country offices in UNICEF then work with local agencies on the ground that they work with to implement the workshops, um, which are primarily based on qualitative activities, and we'll work and have a look at those in a minute. Um, and they work with children and adolescents to explore the perceptions and lived experiences through this process. So we have local organisations working with young people in their local cultural contexts. A flexible implementation framework such as this supports the adap adaptation administration of the methodology across countries by training those in-country facilitators. The in-country facilitators then take the materials, they translate into their own languages, adapt culturally, so often we'd see um, foods that we would... Um, recommend as examples they would use in a local context so they would change for the locally accessed foods or um, market so they might be if it was a, a Mexico city they might be talking primarily about supermarkets where if it was a, a rural place um, in Africa they might be talking about marketplaces so they'd culturally adapt the works um, and then uh, Young and Resilient would provide the technical support and also we'd manage and collate the data that was coming back into us. So it would be translated into the local dialect, the activities, the facilitators and the in-country um, staff would um, run the workshops, take the information, translate back into English where we would then collate and analyse the data. A key component of this is also about youth participation and capacity building. So not only were those staff um, in those in-country offices local, in the local fabric of the communities, but they were most often also youth, young people themselves. So they would engage or the UNICEF country offices would engage with local youth organisations and the facilitation of the workshops would happen or co-facilitation would happen with young people themselves. So the whole way through we were really looking at enabling young people's voices in a safe space that would keep them um, able to voice their true concerns. So what were some of the methods that we used? 
you can see here in several different countries, like I just explained to you, these are all the same activities, but they're just translated into their local dialect um, and presented in their local settings and contexts in different ways. So I'm going to start by sharing what some of these activities might look like so that you can start to have an understanding. The workshop worked obviously focusing on food systems and young people's understanding of food systems. One of the first activities that we had was for them to map their food system. So you can see here, oh, I also forgot to mention previously that being 2021 was this um, time where we were caught between a pandemic and increasing vaccination rates. So some countries were back in person and some countries were still online. So we facilitated the workshops either in person and or online. And you can see here the two worksheets provided by young people. One is an in-person context at the top um, in China. And the second one is done in a digital platform called Miro um, from Indonesia. You can't come to a workshop about participatory engagement without also being participatory engaged. So <laughs> for those people that are in the room, um, on those three tables, sorry, um, presenter table here at the front, Kevin, I'm sorry, you might have to, but there is worksheets there with that look like this. For those that are online, you might need to just um, grab a piece of paper that's close to you. There's also a set of texters that are in the, in the table or on the table. And this is similar to what the setup would have been for the young people in the workshop. So first of all, the facilitator started the workshop by asking and talking to young people about food systems to understand their perspective of food systems. And then they were provided with this map. You can see it's quite blank at the moment. The first thing that they were then asked to do was, if you could think of a food that you would like to eat more of, what would it be? And we would like you to start by drawing this on your map. So if there was one food, and we did also set the task that it had to be a food that would nourish them to help them grow. So something that they eat regularly or would like to eat more of, that they haven't had, um, that they might access. You saw previously that there was a crab that the um, young people in China put a crab on their page. So think of one of those foods. If it was me, I think I'd be putting mangoes. <laughs> Um, so you need to put that at the top of your map. Now, on that map, you need to draw also where you eat that food. So is it at home, at school, or at work? Is it in the park with friends? So the little house in the middle could represent already potentially your home if you wanted to make it that or your school you can use it just as it was just given as an example but you can then add to the map other places that you would eat that food we then need to start to take a step backwards and think all right so this is the food this is where i eat it but how how did it get there this is where that concept of a food system started to come in. And the facilitator would work with young people and say, so you've got your crab, but how did your crab end up in your bowl? And you needed to think about where it actually came from. So in the top right corner of your page or the bottom right, you might have drawn a C if you were drawing, if you were thinking about the crab. Then the participants or you can start to think about the pipeline of the process to where it might have got to. So the farm, the um, seamen might have been catching the crabs that then went into a big seafood market It then went on to a smaller cellar and you need to draw all these steps onto your map. You can do use directional arrows as well. So it might go one way and then it might go back to the factory to be reprocessed if there's a processing element. Feel free to also draw in boats, 
planes, trucks, carts. We had a donkey drawn on one of our maps. We had um, all sorts of different fantastic illustrations from young people. A chicken, a chicken coop, I still remember chicken coop. So you would draw all these elements into your map. Then you need to think about also where you buy that food in that process, which we talked about, markets, supermarkets, corner shops, to finally be able to link in to where you originally identified eating that food. And then finally, we want to know what happens if you don't eat at all. Where's the waste go? Do you keep it for leftovers? Feed it to the dog? Put it in the bin? What's the end point of that system? Feel free to use different coloured textures to illustrate different elements as well. If you're here in the room with us or online, you might be able to um, have some pencils handy. And hopefully by the end, you might have a picture that represents the process that's undergone for you to be able to eat that food. There's one comment from uh, Shal Marimutur that eat insects. It's a good source of protein. <laughs> Definitely. Absolutely. So you can see here, and hopefully your map is starting to come along as well. We not only wanted to understand or gain an understanding of how young people moved and operated within their food systems, how they started to see their food systems enable what they ate or not. We also wanted to know what were those barriers within those food systems. What were the vulnerabilities to them not being able to have that preferred food in their bowl on their table? So taking the same map, we asked them, we had icons for them to stick on here. I should have printed some of these off, sorry, but you're going to have to use your artistic skills instead. We asked them to either draw, so you can see down the bottom, some very um, artic from some fantastic drawings, or stick on some of these vulnerabilities. If they'd chosen, say, a seafood that they wanted to eat was one of the vulnerabilities that stopped them actually eating that food, the pollution in their waters and, their, and within their local food systems, the heavy metals that ended up and pesticides within those, those fish. Was it that they just did not have access to the foods as well? So we looked at the environmental vulnerabilities that they might have seen um, a lot of young people talked about, and I'll go more into this, but about the impact of climatic events, crops wiped out, impact of monsoonal rains at wrong times that then presented this vulnerability in that food system that meant they could not access that food. We also asked them to write context around that, which you can see in those maps which we then analysed, and I'll talk about that a little bit in, in a minute. So feel free to keep chunking away at your map, thinking about some of the obstacles, barriers that you might see that impact your ability to actually access that food now and in the future. So the next part of our workshops really focused on the so what. What can we change and what do young people see as needing to be changed within their food systems to enable all young people to be able to eat a diverse diet that helps them grow. Um, so this activity looked at those, those different levels of influence, so those onion rings in effect around a young person and what could they tell us at those different le levels of influence within their community and society, what could they tell us, what did they see that needed to change? Along with those recommendations that they presented for us, they also talked about 
how they wanted to be engaged in the change, what do they see needing to be changed, and how do young people form part of this solution? And they wrote them into those un onion layers. Following on from that, and one of the final activities for the workshop was they had a chance to say, if they had a chance to say, hey, Prime Minister, President, Leader of our country, these are three ways we think young, young people think we need to strengthen our food system. What are they? So they had these big sheets in the middle of their table if they were in person or digitally, and they brainstormed together some solutions and ways to strengthen their food systems. And they also wanted to know, we wanted to know, or for them to tell us, how the government should act and also how young people want to be engaged in that action. Running alongside this, UNICEF also ran a quantitative survey that was distributed by a mobile phone to, they have a network of youth, um, they're called you report uh, reporters, they're called you reporters and they're young people that share surveys on phones to like-minded young people and we sent out these six questions about their food systems and their food choices. So that was alongside the workshops. When it came to analysis, we coded our dietary data. So we looked at the foods that were chosen on those maps and we started to look at the different foods that were eaten by young people. And we coded that using the NOVA classification system that, look, that looks at the processing level of the foods from minimally processed through to ultra processed foods. We also ran descriptive statistics, primarily proportions, or particularly around the U report data and also then um, some of the aspects that came from the workshop analysis as well. And then all those elements that were laid out on those maps that you saw, we had wonderful research team, some of which in the room, who um, did a fantastic job. When they come back to us, transcribed and analyzed, uh, transcribed and translated into English, uh, we then upload the data and thematically code that um, to look at what are the themes and what are the overarching findings. So what do we find? Part of our presentation today is to tell you what young people told us. What did they want us to then tell the UN Food System Summit to have their voices heard? So between June and August in 2021, UNICEF's country offices in Ghana, Zimbabwe, Sri Lanka, UK, Turkey, Indonesia, Guatemala, China, China, Nepal, Netherlands, Cambodia, Bangladesh, Palestine, Egypt, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, Mexican, Mexico, Kenya, and Nigeria. Oh, that was a mouthful, but I thought I'd just share the spread. You can also see there on the map the spread of countries that we had from low middle income countries to high income countries as well. We recruited over 700 children and adolescents between these countries and there were 19 workshops completed online and 31 workshops completed in person. Of the participants, just over half um, were female, so 59% were female, with an even spread between the age groups from 10 to 17 years and a few less in the age group of 18 to 19 years. China and Indonesia had the largest number of participants overall. So that was for the workshops. For the U report data, we ended up with 23 countries participating. I'm not going to read all of those out for you, but you can see there the black dots representing the spread of countries we had for that. And um, all in all, we had 22,000 or 22,500 um, children and adolescents participating in that. So these are the findings. For all children that participated, food is life. Children often describe food in terms of fuel or a way to obtain and replenish energy, essential for survival and daily activities. Children also express how food is a key element to their survival, growth and development. 78% of U report respondents also noted that they ate or wanted to eat healthy foods, demonstrating an importance of healthy eating to young people. 
Beyond health, children describe the fact that food brings joy and happiness. Food was really described as an essential part of life, bringing joy and happiness. It was seen to be far more than a functional item, but rather one that reflects their identity, place and culture. And how sharing food facilitates connections with others. Children saw food as a unity and humanity that was important for their mental health and physical well-being. So it was far more than just that objective um, being of something that you eat. It was a social fabric and essential in their life. To develop a truly centered, child-centered food system, we need to understand how children navigate their food systems and food environments, deciding what to eat, where to eat, and where to buy it. When children discuss the food they preferred, they talked about how taste, affordability, and healthiness, or, or their determination of healthiness, um, was one of their biggest influences on what they actually chose to eat. This was also supported by the U-Report data that demonstrated that cost and safety of food followed by taste were the biggest influences of food choice across all those different countries. We know that eating can play a role in socialization during adolescence, and in China and Zimbabwe, children talked about how popularity of foods could influence their food choice. U report data also showed that children most commonly consumed unhealthy foods when hanging out with their friends, despite knowingly knowing the importance of healthy food. Children told us about a range of barriers which impacted their ability to consume foods that they saw as healthy, nutritious, and sustainable. Food affordability was the top barrier. And this transcended across all countries. Food was, and was supported by the U report data as well, which you can clearly see here as the cost of healthy foods. Children knew the nutritious foods they would like to eat, but often they were not available or were too expensive. Children also pinpointed challenges within the home environment that created barriers to eating. A lack of their own personal agency around food choice was common in some countries with their parents deciding what food was bought, how it was cooked and what should be consumed. This was often based on cost rather than the actual nutrition quality. So that's when you can see the barrier transcending from not only the own individual choice of the adolescent, but into the family home as well. During the workshop, children mapped a food system around them, which you've all just had a go at doing as well. So you have an understanding of that. Visualizing the journey from growers and producers to their local communities and into their households and families. Children demonstrated a deep understanding of food production, especially when it was a local staple food. Based on their understanding of food systems, children identified a key weakness related to the availability of healthy food. Children discussed how this can be influenced by a wide range of factors. They also recognised the impact of seasonality that really affected the broad availability and cost of certain foods. So navigating that seasonality along with climatic events really impacted the availability of what foods they had in their food systems and what they could then access and consume within their home environments. Children's food maps highlighted the complex nature of their food systems. Did anyone's food maps look as good as that? There's some fantastic thinking that just blew our mind, the food maps that we got back in from these young people. And the deep understanding that they had of those complexities, the different directions that food comes from, the modes of transport, the vulnerabilities. You can see there all those things that they were thinking about to actually how they then ate and consumed their food. They also recognised how food systems contributed directly to climate change and impacted the changing climate. They talked about deforestation, mass farming, genetically modified foods, all these concepts we probably might think of something that might be above the understanding of a young person. They were really clearly able to articulate for us. Children were concerned around the distances their food travelled and they were 
also aware of the complexities of food distribution process. So often the fact that food that they were eating was coming with large food miles attached to it. <clears throat> and how this then contributes to pollution leading to environmental degradation and climate change. Another concern for children was the poor quality of the foods that they were then able to eat or, ate, or having come into their household due to different water pollution chemical fertilizers and unhygienic practices within market spaces. So they were acutely aware of all of those food safety elements and also the food contamination aspects that were impacting their health outcomes. So what to do about it? What did young people tell us that needs to happen? Children saw an urgent need to transform their food systems and to reduce the negative impact on people and the environment. To achieve this, children highlighted the role that governments needed to take in improving foods, food environments and food practices. They want governments to be accountable for establishing and enabling food systems. They gave some clear areas that we've got up here where they wanted to see change. The actions voiced by children are captured in these five clear recommendations. Engage, listen to children and find ways to connect children and young people to debates and transform their food systems. Ask them, listen to them and actually make changes from what they're recommending. Invest, invest in sustainable foods for all children by incentivizing local production of nutritious foods that support the rights of indigenous peoples. Educate. Educate children, families, farmers and decision makers about nutritious and safe foods. Regulate. Enforce policies to ensure food quality, safety and pricing safeguard children from harmful marketing and control of chemical use. Reduce. Reduce the impact of food systems on the environment by empowering communities to grow their own pro produce and supporting sustainable fam farming as a vocation for young people to really build that basis of sustainable food systems now and into the future. I'm just going to leave that quote there to sit with you for a moment, just to see how much young people really could articulate how they see governments really playing a role in this. And th these quotes are directly lifted from what young people have told us. We haven't um, it put any of these words um, in place so you can see how clearly they see the important role of governments. So how do then young children want to be engaged? They, want, they clearly said they wanted to be listened to, they want to have a seat at the decision table, they want to be a part of this change. How do they think it is best to enable this? In these workshops, children were bold in raising their voices and demanding change. Children feel that existing food systems have failed to consistently provide nutritious, sustainable foods for young people across the world. With this, children expressed a strong desire to be engaged in dialogues and actions to transform their food systems. They call on governments and other stakeholders to work with them to create a platform for ongoing participation. What policy mechanisms, how can we start to make sure that this is an ongoing engagement rather than tokenistic? And how this can then be maintained in an ongoing food system transformation, particularly as we move towards that 2030 goal with the sustainable development goals. Together, this great food transformation needs to get underway. The health, nourishment and flourishing of future generations really depend on it. I'm going to leave this last word from one of our participants from the Netherlands because I can't speak for young people. They speak best for themselves. And I feel that this is beautifully articulated from Louisa. Hi, I'm Louisa and I'm from Amsterdam. I think that we, children and teenagers, should be able to control and make decisions for our own future. Adults should listen more to our ideas because we need to clean up the mess they did to the environment. Here in Amsterdam, we came up with the Amsterdam Food Forest. We think that it could be used all around the world. We need to act up as fast as possible and we, children and teenagers, need to speak up because we can make a difference. So let's start right now. 
so the question is now, we've been tasked this enormous task by young people about including them and seeing this as a, a um, not a tokenistic engagement, but one that transpires through as we move to start to actually see a change within nutrition and diet quality of young people across the world. So how do we do that? that? That's the next question that came out of these workshops. So it's as simple as just starting a conversation with young people. And it's key, to, it's key to embed their experiences in whatever you might be working in. If you're working in policy, if you're working in practice, if you're working within community practice, or if you're working at a government level, so having a conversation with young people about what really matters to them within their food systems, and then meaningfully engaging them in the process of that transformation is really important for a sustainable change. With this report, we have had um, considerable impact and with our previous work with UNICEF as well, we've worked with over um, 1,300 children and young people across 30 countries. Um, we're seeing it, we saw it presented at the UN Assembly General at the Food Systems Summit. The next step for all of this work is that question about how do we ensure that young people are truly engaged in policy, in practice, in programming. So at the moment, we're currently working on developing what's called global child and adolescent centered nutrition indicators. And again, we're going to be looking at how people, young people interact within their food environments and food systems, and how can we use these, these indicators that are generated by young people themselves as a measurement of engagement. What's novel about these is that they are child rights focused. So again, we're really placing youth at the center of the solution. And we're looking at what matters to them in diet in nutrition. We're very focused often on weight, height, and in food systems about micronutrient deficiencies, but what is actually important to young people in navigating these food systems and how can that be measured? So we're in the process of developing those at the moment, um, which will then be the next step of this program of work moving forward. These are our two publications. If you would like either of them, the link is there and we can also send that around. And just a huge thank you to everyone for having me here today. Thank you so much, Catherine. It was wonderful to have you today. We'll um, check first if there's any questions in the room and happy to go around answering with a, with a mic. Thank you for the presentation. That's a wonderful project. Um, I was just wondering why Australia is not a participant. That's a good question. As it was in partnership with UNICEF, they selected the countries um, for that. So they chose that Australia wasn't chosen at that point in time. We have worked previously um, our Food and Me report, which preceded this work did have Australia and the Indicators Project has got Australia as well. But yeah, it was um, the partnership organisation chose which countries. Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, Kevin Dunn. Um, I was reflecting on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, I think it's the first or the second is zero hunger, which isn't quite an appropriate description. So it's my first question is, um, uh, do we need to rethink the way we characterise the goals to take on uh, quality food rather than just food. I remember I was visiting in Centurion University in Odisha State and the academics and researchers said they said India doesn't have a food security issue, we have a nutrition issue because um, they've got plenty of rice. Um, but that doesn't uh, quite cut it in terms of nutrition. So, so and, and in, secondly, do you feel that the UN Sustainable Development Goals adequately represent these issues in regard to children and youth as well, whether there's enough in the goals uh, pertinent to the work you're presenting on today. Thank you. Very good question. And um, yes, the zero hunger, the term that often gets talked about is hidden hunger. And I think that's probably a more um, true representation is that it's not necessarily zero hunger, it's the hidden hunger which also represents the micronutrient deficiencies which often is reflective of an, a 
diet that's not of quality. So it's those hidden hungers. So yes, they might be getting food, but is it sufficient? And is it a hidden hunger in terms of what's enabling their growth? And that's really important. We want young people to grow and thrive. We don't want them just to be not hungry. And there's a lot to unpack in that that needs to happen across um, all sustainable development goals to enable that. And I think that's what's really important with the SDG that they can't operate in silo and we need to enable young people, especially around gender equity, especially a lot of young um, girls, young pregnant women in low middle income countries aren't don't have um, adequate access to the nutrition they require for them and their growing child. So there's so much that needs to happen together with the SDGs to enable that. And your question around are young children and adolescents represented enough? No. Absolutely not. And um, that's part of the mobilisation is with this work has has enabled a, um, a start in that. There was a World Food Forum just recently and that is again starting to address the fact that we haven't been giving young people a voice enough around their impact of nutrition or not having access to nutrition to grow but there's still a long way to go. And that's where we see hopefully indicators coming in to be a metric that can actually drive a change in, in that space to ensure people include young people. Uh, it, um, governments developing policies include young people and consider adolescents. It's sort of been this gap of a period of growth where it's just seen as a lot of focus on younger children, which is rightly so, but then they've seen, oh, they're healthy, they're growing, they're all right. But we now know that if they don't have quality diets, they are, they're often undernourished, they're stunted, and that impacts their um, ability to contribute to society moving into adulthood. I just wanted to ask, um, in the responses between the high-income um, countries and the low income countries, were there any differences in terms of the children's responses to their perception of healthiness or their food environment? We've done two of these studies across all those 30 countries and every time I'm overwhelmed by how little differences there are between high and low income countries. I mean, there are obvious differences in terms of, and particularly, um, I think it was Nigeria at the time had quite a, a strict lockdown where they were really locked down into COVID. And they talked a lot about um, transportation of foods being lost. Like they just didn't access particular foods like meat because there was no transportation happening. Um, that wasn't necessarily a country aspect at the time as in uh, income aspect for the country, that was the COVID impact at the time. So there were differences around that. But yeah, again and again, similar themes come across all countries around what influences them, how they view healthy food and non-healthy food and how that limited access, even in high income countries to healthy food is often around cost, even in high income countries as well. So there are definitely differences um, and it's particularly around availability of foods, but in terms of as a general observation, what you would think would be something that's not talked about in high income countries is still represented in the data in a high income country. So I've, yeah, both studies, I've been sort of overwhelmed by the fact that there's not a greater difference as what you would think um, between the high and low income countries. With the indicator, indicator was there any understanding around how children are exposed to food um, for example like there may be food advertising around here in Sydney and all the buses or the billboards would have KFC or McDonald's like were there any aspects or elements that showed whether this advertising marketing can influence or change their kind of food system yeah, very good question. We didn't look as much in this study about it, but we did in our previous study, the Feed and Me report, and social media was the primary um, influence on their food choices. So we looked at what influenced food choices, family, social media, and friends were the top three. 
less so from TV advertisements. It really was a digital influence that they were receiving. Um, but we're just following with the indicators, we've just run four pilot workshops in Australia and we're looking at that in more detail now. But again, it's coming back YouTube, Instagram, influencers, all of those digital technologies are where it seems to be the most of it, that they're registering. So obviously they will see the others, um, but what they view as the biggest influences for them is the digital interface. I think we have some questions online. A lot of comments on um, the presentation that it is great, excellent presentation. A question from Shireen. Um, she says, excellent presentation. I just wondering, in developing countries, which areas the workshops were conducted, rural or urban? Yep, great question. Oh, so we've got, um, we had a spread. So generally uh, instruction was given to in-country officers, UNICEF, that they would try and recruit both a urban and rural. If that happened, um, wasn't always the case. So uh, we had representatives from Palestine. We only had one workshop from them, but then places such as um, China and Indonesia, we had a really good spread of rural versus urban. And um, the differences in those settings were definitely um, there, particularly around the farming and the production side. So there was a lot more discussion in the rural workshops from young people around ways to support young farmers and ways to support young entrepreneurs in um, cropping and farming and supporting sustainable farming um, was something that was noted in those um, spaces. And they were a lot um, affected or impacted by seasonality. So they wouldn't have that ability to access foods out of season. Um, there was one in rural Indonesia that talked about even just milk. Um, and if the cows weren't um, in, in season, the dairy production was limited um, during different parts of the year. So, yeah, definitely around seasonality, availability, and then production were definitely differences between rural and urban um, in, in some of those countries. There is one more question. And this is from Charles Marimuttu, and she's working uh, on law, uh, law and policies on food sustainability. And her question is, to what extent do parents influence their children's eating habits was considered in this study, considering that children often consume what their parents offer them? Yeah, absolutely. So in our previous study, like I said, the three major influences on adolescent food choices were family, social media and friends. So families and in here too, I talked about the fact that they often felt they didn't have agency. So what the interesting part that we found about family in this was, and that's what these workshops give is a nice safe space for young people to talk because their mum and dad aren't there. And um, they often felt they didn't have the power to change what was being eaten in their home, even if they knew it wasn't healthy, um, but they couldn't question it. And that often came down to gender as well, autonomy and agency within that household and then cost of the household. So often um, families and parents made choices, nutritional choices of what to feed their children based on on price and if their food was too expensive they just didn't buy it so it wasn't in the house so yeah families are a huge impact on food choice but in the same breath young people were very aware of that and they were aware aware of the power imbalance within that as well so enabling young people to maybe understand how they can navigate that a little bit more um, is also something that's worth looking at in the future we've got one more in the room Thank you very much for this great presentation. My question is uh, about the uh, the double burden of nutrition in many developing countries. According to your research, you so you've uh, found that 300 million around the world this is uh, and they are suffering from overweight or regarding health issues rather than any other undernutrition uh, health issues. And also, you have said that 78 percent uh, youth, I mean young people young uh, children and adolescents, they are willing to eat healthier foods. So the uh, current scenario the, in real life, there are many children, they are actually suffering from overnutritional health issues. So what are their understanding regarding having healthy food? 
because it's a huge uh, percentage. It's 78 percent. That means most of the uh, young children, they're a bit, I think, aware about having healthy food. But why the scenario is very different or contradictory from this understanding. So is the sustainable development goal they're working on this or not to make them uh, to educate them properly about having healthier food and how they can assure that? Thank you. I think you've got the million dollar question there. Yes, that is what many policymakers, the UN are trying to solve how to make that change. Yes. So interesting, we did find that they had an awareness and a knowledge and they also saw food as vital to ensuring that they did live a long, healthy life. But then in action, like you said, overweight and obesity and chronic diseases is by far the biggest um, non-communicable disease in the world. So what's the disconnect? I could give you a whole nother <laughs> talk, but it comes back to those food systems and those um, determinants within the food systems. What's then disenabling young people to access healthy foods, what's impacting their food choices. It's a combination of so many, and that's what we really found in this. It's what the education level of their parents is, what their parents are buying within the household, what the food uh, climatic events have been to take out our entire crop that season, which means they don't have access to particular staple foods, or, and then they're buying imported foods that are less of a healthy option. It's the environment in terms of... Uh, the food um, takeaway shops and, and their food environments that they're navigating, all of those things then drive the food choices in the direction of unhealthy foods. So even though they know they need to be eating healthy, we don't have the supportive food environments and systems for them to eat healthy. And that's what we need to target globally. There is one, there is one more comment or question. This is from Joanna. Any comments on highly processed foods and heavily sprayed foods that our children consume on a daily basis and how that might impact them in a long run? So interestingly around, um, they were very aware of the impact of contaminants within their food, which I was surprised at, but they often talked about the need <clears throat> to regulate and look at how much fertilizers are sprayed across crops and how much of that's then ending up in food in sorry in water systems that's then impacting their food sources as well so in terms of comments around that they were very aware of those those sort of cross contamination and then impacts on health um, and there was a lot of call to action around government regulation and making sure that their food was free from pollutants um, in terms of their questions around processed foods, they could easily map the processing journey, but they didn't directly talk about the health, the um, undesirable health benefits of high processed foods. It was more around the pollutants. So they talked about that. Yeah. Just like to thank you so much, Dr. Fleming, um, for presenting our last uh, thought leadership event of the year. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.